On today's story session, a tale about how being a bird sucks. This is The Sparrow and His Four Children. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be, which, in my opinion, just made them way better and more entertaining. So I've got the most true-to-the-original version of Grimm's fairy tales that I could find, and we're going through it front-to-back, story by story. We'll figure out the unintended lessons each story teaches, and at the end of each episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or TV show. Let's get right to it with today's tale, titled, The Sparrow and His Four Children. We begin. A sparrow had four young ones in a swallow's nest. Because I guess sparrows like to take other people's homes. When they were fledged, some bad boys broke up the nest. But fortunately, all the young birds escaped in a whirlwind. Who the hell are these bad boys? It's very vague. Were they people? Other birds? Who knows? Irrelevant. Then their father became sorry that his sons went off into the world before he was able to warn them about its many dangers or to give them good advice about how to fend for themselves. In the autumn, a great many sparrows came together in a wheat field. It was there that the father came upon his four sons once again, and he joyfully took them home with him. That solved itself very quickly. Ah, my dear sons, I was terribly concerned about you all summer, especially since you had been carried away by the wind before I could give you my advice. Now listen to my words, obey your father, and keep this in mind. Little birds must face grave dangers. Yeah, I'm guessing they faced some pretty grave dangers when they were alone fending for themselves for months. This isn't really helpful advice right now, Dad. Then he asked the oldest son where he had spent the summer and how he had fed himself. I lived in the garden and hunted caterpillars and little worms until the cherries turned ripe. Ah, my son, said the father, such tasty morsels are not bad, but it can be dangerous searching for them. So from now on, be on your guard especially when people walk around the gardens carrying long green poles that are hollow inside and have a loop on the top. What the hell is he referring to? What is that? I have no idea what these long green poles that are hollow on the inside and have a hole on the top could be. Is this some type of implement that was used to kill birds back in olden times? No idea. Yes, father, said the son. And what should I do when a green leaf is stuck over the hole with wax? Again, I have no idea what this is referring to. Where have you seen this? In a merchant's garden, the young bird said. Oh, my son, responded the father. Merchants are wily people. If you have been among such worldly folk, you have learned enough of their shrewd ways. But see that you use all this shrewdness well and don't become overconfident. Okay, that doesn't really answer his question of what to do when a green leaf is stuck over the hole with wax. This feels like a dad sort of deflecting when he doesn't actually know the answer to his kid's question. Like, he doesn't know how to solve the math homework, so he's just like, Ah, you should use your cleverness and shrewdness to solve the math problem, but don't become overconfident. It's like, all right, dad, you're just bullshitting. Then he asked the next son, Where did you set up your home? At court, said the son, Sparrows and silly little birds have no business being in such a place. There is too much gold, velvet, and silk armor and harnesses, sparrow hawks, screech owls, and falcons. Keep to the horse stables, where the oats are winnowed and threshed. Then you may be lucky enough to get your daily piece of bread and eat it in peace. Yes, father, said this son. But what shall I do if the stable boys make traps and set their gins and snares in the straw? Many a bird has gone away limp because of this. Where have you seen this? At court, among the stable boys. Shouldn't that have been obvious? 
Oh, my son, those court servants are bad boys. Again, he's using this phrase, bad boys. This is getting kind of weird. If you have been at court and mixed with the lords and left no feathers behind, you have learned quite a bit and will know how to get by in the world. However, keep your eyes open all around you and above you, for often even the smartest dogs have felt the bite of wolves. Again, he doesn't really have any advice that was helpful here. His son figured it out. He made it work. And his one question, this guy doesn't have an answer to. Now the father took his third son to account. Where did you try your luck? I cast my lot on the highways and country roads, and sometimes I managed to find a grain of wheat or barley. Indeed, this is a fine meal, said the father, but keep on the alert for signs of danger and look around carefully, especially when someone bends over and is about to pick up a stone. Then make sure you take off quickly. This is so not helpful advice from this father sparrow. That's true, said the son. But what should I do when someone may already be carrying a rock or a stone from a walk under his shirt or in his pocket? Where have you seen this? Among the miners, dear father. When they return from work, they generally carry stones with them. Miners are workers and resourceful people. If you've been around mining, boys, you've seen and learned something. And then there's a little song here. Fly there if you will, but this you must know. Mining boys have killed many a sparrow. Okay, just because you're going to make it sing-songy doesn't mean you actually gave helpful advice here, Dad. Again, not helpful. Finally, the father came to the youngest son. You, my dear little chatterbox, you always were the silliest and weakest. Okay, kind of a shitty thing to say. He just lived alone and figured it out for months without any of your help. Maybe not throw shade at him now that he's come back and clearly did way better than you expected him to. Stay with me. The world is filled with crass and wicked birds that have crooked beaks and long claws. Stick to your own kind and pick up little spiders and caterpillars from the trees or cottages. This way you'll live long and be content. All of this Father Sparrow's advice... Is, is basically just, like, telling them to be cowardly. And granted, you're a sparrow. Maybe that's your best option. Just, like, stick to finding little grains and spiders and stuff. But he doesn't really seem to be giving them a lot of credit for having figured it out and done really well in these really crazy situations for months entirely on their own. The youngest son replied, My dear father, he who feeds himself without causing harm to other people will go far. And no sparrow hawk, falcon, eagle, or kite will do him harm if, each morning and evening, he faithfully commends himself and his honestly earned food to merciful God, who is the creator and preserver of all the birds of the forest and village. Likewise, it is he who hears the cries and prayers of the young ravens, for no sparrow or wren shall ever fall to the ground against his will." Where have you learned this? The son answered. When the gust of wind tore me from you, I landed in a church. There I picked the flies and spiders from the windows and heard those words during a sermon. Then the father of all sparrows fed me during the summer and protected me from misfortune and fierce birds. So it sounds like he basically already did what his father is advising him. He just found a church and then ate a bunch of little spiders and and insects and stuff. Faith, my dear son, if you take refuge in the churches and help clean out the spiders and the buzzing flies, and if you chirp to God like the young ravens and commend yourself to the eternal creator, you will stay well, even if the entire world be full of wild and malicious birds. And then another little song that's longer. For he who worships God in every way, who suffers, waits, is meek, and prays, who keeps his faith and conscience pure, God will keep him safe and sure. The end. Well, he never mentions any advice about praising God or being religious or anything prior to this, prior to this bird who ended up in a church. 
before the youngest one mentions the church thing, he's just trying to give general, practical, keep an eye out kind of advice on navigating dangerous situations. It's not like, trust God and you'll be fine. It's like, no, watch out for those rocks. And watch out for those traps from the stable boys. No mention of God or faithfulness in any capacity whatsoever up until this ending point here. It's a bit of a weird turn at the end. But the point being, being a bird sounds like it sucks. Their nest got messed up by bad boys. Whatever the hell those were. And now they've got to figure out these dangerous situations. And yeah, the dad has no good answer to any of their advice or specific questions. He's just like, oh, if you've seen that, then you definitely learned something. Good for you. Like, okay, thanks, but that still doesn't answer my question or help me at all. And it kind of feels like I've learned more and experienced more danger than you have. So ultimately, they didn't really seem to need the dad at all. They were all totally fine here. And the message here is a bit muddled. And based on how the story ends with that super intense, hardcore religious message, and I looked this up online and confirmed it, the lesson seems to be to trust in God and you'll be safe and taken care of. But the other three sparrows were fine. And I'm just going to be clear and say, I don't act like I have the answers on religion. It's great for some people, and that's fantastic. No judgment on religion or religious people. Anything I say here is purely analyzing what happens in this story and what it seems to say or imply. So I think that might be the message here, is to each their own and just find the situation that works for you. Because the youngest brother found the church and it worked out for him great, and the three other sparrows survived just fine too. It is odd, though, and kind of interesting, that the father sparrow actually points out the way that those three survived was by adaptability and using their minds and abilities to learn about the dangers surrounding them and figure out how to navigate those surroundings to get what they need. And he's like, good work. Meanwhile, the last youngest sparrow just found a church and was like, hope this works out. And it did. And the father applauds this above the rest of them, it seems like. But he doesn't appear to be better off than the others. Is the implication that he's safer and life is easier for him because he doesn't have to work hard or face dangers? And the youngest sparrow says, No hawk, falcon, eagle, or kite will do him harm if he commends himself to God. So is it implying that by entrusting your life to the whims of God, you'll be safer and better off? Not sure I agree with that, because hawks and falcons are killing and eating birds all the time. And you can transfer that to people too. Is the sparrow saying that any bird that gets killed or has something bad happen to them is not faithful enough? Because that's not a great message there. Bad things happen to good people all the time, regardless of how faithful they are. That's just part of life. I mean, the priest or someone who works at the church could hate birds and set bird traps or something. So that's just pure luck that this particular church doesn't seem to mind having birds flying around and pooping all over the church. It does seem that the youngest bird is the only one who isn't scared of predators, so maybe peace of mind? Maybe that's that's the Bennett bonus here? That's pretty great. I'm not sure it's totally legit because he still is totally in danger, but at least he has peace of mind? It's pretty condescending, though, of the youngest bird toward his brothers, because from their perspective, he's basically saying, so if we get killed, it's because we're not religious or faithful enough. You said no bird or wren dies Unless it, unless against God's will. So if we die, then it's because God said so, because we weren't faithful enough. It's not because of, you know, the rocks or the, the traps or anything like that. You just happened to fly into a church. We flew in different directions and didn't come across a church. That's just pure chance that you fell into that cushy situation. And I mean, this, of course, brings to light the issue. I don't want to get too into this. This brings into the issue of world religions, where it's like, well, if someone is born into a religion and billions of other people aren't, how are those billions of other people supposed to find the path that this particular religion says is correct when they were born on the opposite side of the world in a different religion? Anyway, I don't want to get too into the weeds with this religion stuff, but the story is messy. The message of the story is messy. But it brings up a discussion on many different ways you can live your life, with religion being one of them. And you know what? Great. Great discussion to have. I don't know why... The story actually explicitly says that the youngest sparrow 
is the weakest and least capable of all the sparrows, and that the father figured if anyone was going to die without his guidance, it would be the youngest one. So he's like, stay with me. And I don't, that's kind of, that seems to be sort of a shitty comment or implication about the one who ended up finding religion, because it seems to imply that if someone is weak or incompetent, then their best hope for survival is to entrust their fate to a higher power and hope for the best. That seems super harsh, if I'm being honest. And I don't know why the story even felt the need to say that the youngest one was the weakest. The father just throws that in there. The youngest one might have been fine, regardless. He seems just as resourceful. He figured out a good situation. Good for him. The other sparrows figured it out too. There's no need to give the youngest one crap. Be like, you are super weak. He found the church. He's doing great. Good for him. Well done, youngest sparrow. I think the actual lesson of this story is that there are many ways to live your life and that no way is better than another. You just make it work for you and how you want to live. You just have to deal with the situation you find yourself in and try to do the best you can. If that involves religion, great, good for you. If not, sure, good for you as well. Just adapt to the situation around you. All right. A lot of religion talk. I didn't really expect to get that into it, but that's the story we got. Some of these have weird religious angles. Let's adapt this thing now. So, I do really like the premise of a family getting split up and the children all getting thrown to the wind in different directions, but thriving in each of their distinct situations. So let's make this... Okay, this might be a bit of a longer adaptation, so bear with me here. Let's make this a TV show. And that way we can spend time following each of the sons as they grow and rise through the ranks in their own way, and then finally they come together. So we'll have this take place... A couple hundred years in the past, this isn't going to be modern day, and it'll be a couple hundred years in the past, and we'll set it in Southeast Asia. So there's a father who lives in a remote town with his four young sons, and the father will be played by Iko Uwe, the Indonesian actor from The Raid. He is awesome. And their mother died when they were babies, and the father raised them as best he could, teaching them resiliency, and also teaching them how to fight and be super badass. Because Iko Uwe, the actor, is an incredible martial artist, practices Penchak Salat, and pardon my pronunciation, I'm, that's probably not accurate, but he's amazing. He's, he's a badass in any event. Anyway, the oldest son, let's say is 10, with each son one or two years younger than the next, and their town gets attacked by a neighboring region, and the family isn't together when this happens, so the brothers and the father all have to flee and ultimately get separated. And since the town is on the water, and in Southeast Asia there's lots of different islands in the region, most of the sons have to hurriedly hop onto the nearest boat as the townspeople are all, are all fleeing in different directions. And this invading force takes over the area. And the father flees into the hills and is part of a small clan that lives in the forest and occasionally has to fight off scouting parties that they cross paths with. And the oldest son, he jumps into a boat that finds its way to a remote island where he joined a group of farmers who cultivate the land. And the second son jumps into a different boat that found its way to a small city where he lived on the street, but he's very clever and resourceful and thrifty and quickly works his way up to become a successful merchant. And the third son jumped into a boat that found its way to a mining town. And there he grew very strong and, and resourceful and he gradually became in charge of a big team of miners there. And in this initial attack, when their town is attacked, there's a dramatic moment where a pair of brothers see each other in different boats as they're quickly trying to escape. And they call out to each other, but the boats get separated in the chaos and they lose each other and, and they're off, off adrift. And the fourth and youngest son was taken prisoner by the invading forces and forced to join them. He has no choice but to lean into this and becomes a a devout follower of their religious principles, and he even manages to work his way up to become a spiritual advisor to, to the king's son. And for the sake of his survival, that the youngest son has to buy into the ideals of the group that made him prisoner. So he ends up basically being on their side, even though, of course, he's very conflicted about this. So we spend a number of episodes following each of the sons and the father as they rise to these levels and navigate their various circumstances for years, and the sons all grow up, this could go on for a long time, like multiple seasons. You could get like six seasons out of this, possibly more. But ultimately, 
it becomes clear that the invading evil force intends to undertake a much larger mission and try to completely take over and enslave the surrounding areas and take control of the whole region, so everyone's in danger here. Initially, the youngest son, who's, who's just kept prisoner and is now this religious advisor, he tries to steer the king and the king's son down a more noble path using their religious principles, but the king overrules him. And the youngest son realizes that while these people hold up the principles of this religion that they've created, the king's greed overpowers their morals. So he turns on them, and he flees with a small group of religious followers. And meanwhile, the brother who became a merchant knows that at least one of the brothers is still out there, because he saw him escaping on a different boat. And so he, he's always dreamt of finding him, but he doesn't know where to start. But he's a merchant, so he has many boats going in all directions, and is always making new contacts for trade. So he always keeps an eye out for his brothers and for, for people from their town. And one day... He sees an older woman who he recognizes from their town. And so they embrace, and the merchant asks if she knows where his brother is because he saw the woman escaping on the same boat as his brother. And the woman says his brother is working in the mines. So this merchant goes to the mines, and there he sees his brother. And they're reunited, and it's glorious. And the miner brother tells the merchant that years earlier... He heard that, that more boats from their town had been scattered all throughout the, the archipelago. And so together, the two brothers set out to see if they can find their father and the other two brothers. They hop from island to island, looking for people from their town. And they do find people from their town, some of whom even decide to join them. But they can't find the father or the eldest or the youngest brother. And someone tells them that he heard that the youngest brother joined the evil empire that destroyed their town. And they're like, oh, this is, this is bad. What are we going to do? He betrayed us. And they also hear that their father never made it off the island, and in fact is now leading the rebel forces that live deep in the forest. And they hear this from an older fellow who was, who was part of the rebels, but decided that it was a lost cause, and he left the father fleeing across the archipelago, and this, this older man feels guilty about this now, now that he sees the sons, and decides to join up with them as they seek the other townspeople. He joins up with them. He's like, I'm going to make good. I'm going to fight for, for justice. And finally, they hear about a reclusive farming community that lives deep in the mountains on one island. And they decide they might as well try their luck because they've looked everywhere else and they don't know where the eldest brother is. Never heard anything about him. So they hike deep into the heart of the island. And sure enough, they find the eldest brother. And he says he joined the farmers and went deep into the mountains so that even if the evil empire came, they could use the terrain to protect themselves. They have all these traps and various things, and barricaded themselves there. With the knowledge that their father is part of a rebel group in the forest, and their brother might have joined the enemy, they decide they have a duty to seek out their father. And they set out across the water toward their homeland. They land on the island, and are immediately attacked and taken prisoner by the evil forces. They're tied down thrown into a tent to await judgment. And a couple hours later, someone walks in and they realize that it's their father. They realize that they weren't taken prisoner by the evil forces like they thought, but instead by the band of rebels that usually hide in the forest, but they were in an encampment near the beach because they were running reconnaissance missions from the water along the coast. And they thought the brother's ship was an attack from the empire. And so the father then frees them, of course, and he takes them back to their stronghold deep in the forest and that's where they are reunited with the youngest brother. And the family is all together again. And the youngest brother tells them everything he knows from his time with the Empire, and they decide they have to do something. So now they're a pretty decent-sized group, since they've been collecting people on the travels through the archipelago. And they also have the resources of the merchant and the ships, and access to weapons and supplies. So they go back through the archipelago to gather support, and so they get resourceful and crafty fighters from the eldest son's mountain clan. And they get the giant squad of strong miners who know how to use explosives from the other brother's mining town. And even more groups. And so the youngest son and his religious followers, they're like super badass stealth fighters. Like warrior monks kind of situation. Super into that. And they coordinate a big attack, which starts from the father's rebel group. And then the other groups get involved at different points in different ways. And in a dramatic battle... They retake their homeland, and when it's all said and done, they decide to make the father 
the man who never gave up the fight to take back their home, the new leader of the town, which is now a city, probably. And there is now all the different islands and clans, all still independent, but they are unified in spirit and working together. And together they all thrive. And the eldest son is in charge of agriculture in the new town, and the merchant brother is the head of commerce, and the mining brother is in charge of building and infrastructure, and the youngest is the spiritual leader. And the father's sons are all back together with him again. The end. Damn, that ended up being one of the longest adaptations I've done. Probably the longest. And I might actually write that one. I might turn that one into a novel. I really, I really actually had a good time coming up with that one. Obviously, when I write it, I'll make some tweaks and changes. But I actually kind of like that. I actually really like that story. If that was a TV show, you could get a whole string of seasons out of that. I'd watch the hell out of that show. But that will do it for this week's episode of the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled The Little Magic Table, The Golden Donkey, and The Club in the Sack. Jeez, guys, you couldn't have come up with a catchier title. To the title's credit, though, there's a lot going on in that title, so I have to admit, I'm intrigued. You don't hear about many magic tables. I don't even know what table magic could be. Maybe it can change sizes? Maybe it's unbelievably strong? And does the donkey just have gold-colored hair, or is it literally made of gold? The club in the sack on its own isn't very remarkable, but I'm guessing someone is going to take that club out of the sack and do some wild shit with it at some point. So the title does bring to mind a, a whole list of questions. So, gotta admit, I'm intrigued. Come on back next week for all those answers. My name is X Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Thank you.